welcome, my friends, to another show of Juicy Fruit Reviews. I'm your host, Juicy, and this show focuses on reviewing scripts, movies, filmmaking, and music provided in film and TV shows, and much more. In this episode, we'll review the script from the movie I, Robot, but this isn't the production version. This was an original version written by a writer called Hilary Seitz. She's an uncredited screenwriter, and they turned it down and brought in a couple other writers. So, But before we do that, make sure you smash that like or thumbs up button, share the video, comment, follow, do all that neat stuff. We want to hear from you and what you thought about this episode and what you think might make great episodes in the future. What movies or scenes or TV shows or music like soundtracks do you want us to explore? You know you want to do it, so do it! So this is what the premise of the story is. In 2035, a technophobic cop investigates a crime that may have been perpetrated by a robot, which leads to a larger threat to humanity. The credited screenwriters for the movie version are Jeff Ventor and Akiva Goldsman. The script, this script is 111 pages long, and the differences between this and the movie version are the characters, the characteristics of them, their, sometimes their attitudes are a little different. For example, I was more sympathetic or empathetic for Will Smith. Um, in this version, he seemed kind of like, you know, not so honorable. <laughs> he didn't cross the line, I'm just saying, difference. And then the, the roles, um, so Lanning, Lansing, I think, Lanning, I think is his name, the one who died, uh, they gave him the credit for actually creating the three laws as well as kind of, you know, founding um, USR. And then some of the events, even though the main events are still the same, some of the events, the smaller events are, are changed. So we're going to go ahead and review the first 10 pages. So let's get started. So once again, we're looking at the script iRobot, and this was written by Hilary Zeitz, and she is uncredited as a writer. They didn't use her version, of course, and then they used, but they did use, or had two writers come in and and do some more writing. Now there is a, another one, Isaac Asmanoff. He was also credited as a writer for this, even though he didn't write out directly say something for this movie. Apparently he had written about the three laws in a story, I guess, early on, or some years ago. Anyways, he's uh, credited as a writer for this movie, which is interesting. So let's take a look at the script. I, Robot by Hilary Seitz. And I'm just going to go ahead and read through this. Okay, so fade in. On a deep, deep darkness, a flicker of light off to the side, just barely noticeable, orange-yellow as we realize it's fire, a sound, something shattering, then a disembodied voice, muted. We can't quite make out what it's saying. As it gets louder and louder, we, when we finally understand, disembodied voice, you are in danger. Cut to Inside Spooner's apartment, clothes on, Dell Spooner's face, his eyes snapping open, his face covered in sweat. Pull back to reveal him lying in bed, sheets tangled around his legs. Alarm clocks playing something relentlessly cheerful. Spooner slaps it off, sits up wincing, bends his right arm stiff. He reaches for a bottle of pills, shakes out a couple and swallows them, trying to forget that dream. You are in danger. He rubs his hands over his face, gets out of bed, his apartment basic. Unremarkable, bearing the signs of someone who lives alone, shades drawn, a little messy. Inside the shower, morning, Spooner turns his face into the jet of water. Bathroom, morning, shaves with a razor, using his left hand, nicks the cleft of his, of his chin. Shit. Inside the kitchen, morning, stares down at a single egg in a saucepan, waiting for it to boil. Inside the hallway in the morning, heads down the highway, or heads down the hallway, Looping a knotted tie around his neck, kicks some neglected mail from the door and reaches for the handle, takes a deep breath, and outside a suburban street in the morning, steps outside into the flow of commuters, heading for the elevated trains. Elbow to elbow, a river of humanity. Spooner moves along like everyone else. Suddenly his shoulders tense, that feeling at the back of his neck, he turns and sees. A robot just behind him, humanoid in design, but still obviously a machine. Metal and synthetic casings covering hydraulic muscles. The thing senses his stare, looks up with a muted were robot, m metallic voice. Good day, sir. Spooner speeds up his pace, weaving through the crowd to lose the robot. We now realize this is the future. 
Towering apartment buildings block the sun, the street packed with traffic. Pedestrians wearing their computers like form-fitting por portable offices. Uh, sound familiar? Humanoid robots dotting the crowd, following their owners, walking slowly, deliberately, carrying boxes, groceries, briefcases. Stamped on all the robot sides, a logo, three law safe. Spooner stops to wait at a light with other pedestrians. He steps off the curb just as the traffic signal swivels around, training its large digital eye on him. Traffic light. Please return to the sidewalk. Spooner dodges several cars on his way across the street. Traffic light. Please return to the sidewalk. The traffic signal tracking him. Traffic light. You are in violation of city ordinance 14B, 14-B726. Spooner throws up his hand, flipping it the bird just as snap. It takes this picture. Cut to you. As we get closer, congested roads and freeways begin to disappear below ground into a series of subterranean tunnels. The old streets have become huge, spacious plazas. Inside police headquarters, homicide unit, morning, a vast open plan situation room lined on one side by a series of glass enclosed rooms. On the other side, a giant screen with real-time video of various streets and buildings. Spooner arrives at his desk. Unlike the others, it's a mess, a slender of computer screen curving along the front of it. Several electronic messages say the same thing. See me, Lieutenant Bergen, off screen. Ever heard of the phrase, lead by example? Spooner looks up. Lieutenant John Bergen stands in front of his desk, holding up a citation with a photo of Spooner giving the traffic signal of the finger. Spooner doesn't ring a bell. Lieutenant Bergen, pointing to Spooner's badge, it's on your badge. Spooner takes the citation and drops it into a drawer filled with about 50 others. Lieutenant Bergen, the traffic division filed an official complaint this morning. Spooner, the traffic division is a machine. Lieutenant Bergen, look, I know there's going to be an adjustment period, Dale. Spooner, I'll send him a letter of apology, maybe some flowers, a box of chocolates. Just then, Spooner's phone rings. He throws Bergen a look, then snatches up the receiver. Spooner, Spooner, homicide, cut to outside U.S. robotics establishing day. A sprawling glass and metal complex covering many city blocks. The entrance is a large plaza filled with people and robots. Inside U.S. Robotics Metal Corridor during the day, an elevator opens with a whoosh. Spooner steps onto a featureless corridor, his footsteps echoing. He stops at the set of opposing doors, looks over at one when the other suddenly opens. Inside U.S. Robotics plush conference room, continuous, a warm mahogany paneled room. In sharp contrast, contrast to the cold metal space outside, Spooner steps inside. At the end of the long conference table sits an old man, sparkling blue eyes, old-fashioned suit. Old man, hello there, please come in. Spooner hesitates. Old man, it's all right, you can sit, sit. Spooner doesn't, looks around the room. The old man lifts up a coffee pot, pours some coffee into a single cup. Old man, coffee, Spooner, interested. You're offering me a cup of coffee? Old man, yes, but you are to say, no, thank you. Spooner nods a little. The old man raises the coffee to his lips, but doesn't take a sip. Old man, coffee? Spooner, no, thank you. Old man, as you wish. The old man takes a sip. He doesn't move. There is no movement except for the whisper of steam rising from the coffee pot. Spooner, you want me to tell me something about Dr. Hogan Miller, about his death? The old man smiles. Old man. I want to tell you that his death was not a suicide, Spooner. And why do you say that, old man? Why? Because I want you to know it, Spooner. I understand that. But what specifically leads you to believe that he didn't commit suicide, old man considers? Nothing specifically. Spooner shifts his, shifts his weight, agitated. Spooner, under normal circumstances, that wouldn't be enough to get you a homicide investigation, old man. But this is not normal circumstances, is it, Detective Spooner? Spooner. No, it isn't. Old man, then you will find out who killed Dr. Hogan Miller, yes? And then you will tell me? Spooner's losing his patience. Spooner, if you were murdered, doctor, I'll find out, and you'll be the first to know. Just then, the hologram of Dr. Hogan Miller vanishes in a burst of light, as does the table, the coffee pot, and the conference room. Spooner suddenly finds himself standing in front of a large view screen inside a, a small metal chamber. Inside U.S. Robotics, corporate boardroom during the day. Two large doors emblazoned with the U.S. Robotics logo open automatically. Inside an enormous glass enclosed boardroom looking out over the entire complex. Spooner walks through the doorway, his escort robot trailing behind him. An army of corporate types sit around a conference table, young, energetic. You can practically feel the brains and ambition. Spooner, 
Usually, I ask who's in charge. Spooner's eyes lock with a man sitting at the head of the table. 60s, handsome, charismatic. Dr. Lance Ro Robertson, founder and CEO of U.S. Robotics. Spooner, but everyone knows you, Dr. Robertson. Robertson smiles, pretends to instruct his people. Robertson, remind me to cut back on my talk show appearances. Laughter. Robertson, welcome to U.S. Robotics, Detective. I regret you are not visiting us under more pleasant circumstances. Allow me to introduce Mr. Aronson, our head of legal affairs. A prematurely graying man leaning against the wall. Nods hello, Robertson. And the gentleman to my right is Dr. Alfred Landing, Director of Research. Alfred Landing, only one there in a tie. Nods. Robertson, they'll be available to answer any questions you might have during your investigation. You'll understand how anxious we are to resolve this matter, especially before the press gets wind of it. There are some anti-robot sentiments out there, as you know, Detective, and we're not eager to stir them up, so where would you like to begin? Booner, we can begin with whether or not the old man put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. A palpable wave of tension shoots through the group. Aronson, you don't have to answer that, Dr. Robinson. Robertson waves him off. Robertson, Susan, perhaps you can assist us here. Everyone looks down at the other end of the table, a beat. Then an attractive young woman gets to her feet. Susan Calvin, hair tucked behind her ears, looking at everyone but Spooner. Calvin, Dr. Hogemiller was a schizoid personality who generally eschewed social relationships, rejecting people in favor of solitary activities involving machines. He spent almost all of his time at the lab here and at his home. As a result, he was highly susceptible to depression. Robertson, Dr. Calvin is our chief psychologist. Spooner, if that was your diagnosis, why didn't you see this coming? Calvin turns, finally meeting Spooner's eye, as if the answer is obvious. Calvin, this is U U.S. Robotics Detective. 75% of our employees fit that description. Lanning interceding. You'll have to excuse the, doc excuse the doctor. We're all a little on edge. This has, the, this has been a difficult and emotional morning. Spooner throws around a, a look around the room, then back at Calvin. Spooner, yeah, I can see you're all broken up. Robertson responds to Spooner's skepticism. Robertson, Dr. Hogan Miller was at my side from the very beginning of this company. We developed the three laws of robotics together. But these days, science is a young man's game. By the time you hit 30, your best years are behind you. Some of us kicked upstairs, and others, I'm afraid, aren't so lucky. Robertson stands, meeting over. Robertson, Dr. Hogan Miller took his own life. I trust you will come to the same swift conclusion, Detective. Dr. Lanning will make himself available if you have any further questions. Spooner looks over at Calvin. Spooner, I want her to help me. Calvin, unhappy with this arrangement. Calvin, that's not really my department, Robertson pointed. Susan would be happy to assist you. And with a gesture, Robertson dismisses everyone inside a metal hallway during the day. Spooner and Calvin heading down the same hallway he was in before. Cat sight of a couple of robot technicians. Spooner, under his breath. Ah, oh, Christ, toasters. As they duck under the police tape. Inside Hogan Miller's lab during the day, enter Hogan Miller's lab. Alive with activity, crime scene technicians, mobile analysts, analysis units, light scans running across. Hogan Miller's lifeless face, black gunpowder fanning out around his contorted lips. Spooner throws a look around the lab. Robots everywhere, mostly incomplete. Torsos, arms, legs dangling from the ceiling. A sergeant passes them by. Calvin, is everything all right, Detective? Spooner, yeah, this is just how I like my robots in pieces. As they approach Hogan Miller's body, the lead crime scene investigator, Baldez, gets up to meet them. Baldez, to, to Spooner, can you believe it, man? You as a robotics. I didn't think I would ever see the inside of this building. Hand Spooner a plasma corp clipboard. Spooner signs it awkwardly with his left hand. Spooner, what's the rundown? Bal Baldez, Heinrich Hogan Miller, 64 years old, weapon, a small caliber 22, registered in his name. Looks like he walked in, locked the door, and snuffed himself. Spooner, cocking his head to look at Hogan Miller's face. Spooner, I know someone who disagrees with you. Baldez, who? Spooner stands, pointing down at Hogan Miller. Spooner, him, and steps over the body, leaving a confused Baldez stepping deeper into the lab. Calvin following. Spooner, I spoke to a dead man today. Want to tell me about that? Calvin, Dr. Hogan Miller's hologram 
took his appointments, attended staff meetings. He hated corporate life. The hologram enabled him to focus on his work. It's just a device, Detective Spooner, a device that called the police. Calvin, the sound of the shotgun would have triggered a 911. Spooner, but the call came directly to me. Calvin, we're talking about a mechanism designed by Hogemiller to say provocative things, to irritate and confound his colleagues. Spooner, and that's what you think it is? Calvin, I'm sorry, but this whole investigation is a result of a dead man's toy messing with your head. They pass half a robot hanging from a hook. Spooner curls his lips, swivels the robot's head so it's not looking at him. Spooner, when's the last time any of you actually spoke to Hogemiller? I mean, human to human. Calvin, I couldn't say. Spooner, take a guess. Calvin, I don't guess, detective. But if pressed, I would reason it had been a considerable length of time. Spooner, how well did you know him? Calvin, gently swivels the robot's head back to where it had been. Calvin, not well, but I admired his work tremendously. Spooner, studies her for a beat, then turns back to the body. Two coroners entering with a high-tech body box. Spooner, I get the whole mad scientist thing. Hogan Miller was past his prime, isolated, eccentric. He enters a room, locks the door, and is found minutes later with the bullet fired through his mouth into his brain. Everything about this case says suicide. Calvin, you don't sound convinced. Coroner, start loading the body into the box. Spooner, even people who live a life of logic and precision rarely arrange their deaths so perfectly. Turning to her, what all this is missing is personality. And he starts for the door. Spooner, you have 24-hour surveillance? Inside the metal hallway continuous, they head out to, to the hallway, a mechanical door guard rolling into place behind them. It's com Calvin, it's company policy. Spooner, I want to see the tapes. Calvin, hurrying up to keep up with him. This is hardly how she wanted to spend her morning. Calls out into the air. Calvin, Victor, at the end of the corridor near the elevator, a bright circle appears, hovering just in front of the wall. Two small slits grow into a round black eyes, and a thin mouth expands into an, an enormous smile. Calvin, Detective, meet Victor, our building's supercomputer. He's the checks and balances of USR. To Victor. Victor, Detective Spooner's heading up the, the investigation into the death of doc, Dr. Hogan Miller. Victor smiles big. Spooner furrows his brow. Spooner, you look like a very happy computer. Victor responds in a gentle male voice. Victor, thank you. That's very kind. Calvin, the, te the detective needs to see our security tapes. Hey, if you like this episode of Juicy Fruit Reviews, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you know every time I drop a video. We'd love to have you join our Juicy Fruit family and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The links are in the description box below. We appreciate your support as it provides Juicy Fruit Productions the access and resources that we need to keep bringing content like this to you. From us here at Juicy Fruit Productions and Rob Entertainment Corporation, this does it for another fine episode of Juicy Fruit Reviews. I'm your host, Juicy, saying thank you for watching and thanks for the memories. Follow me to the place I'm